what is introduction uh, what is big data itself that is where we're going to start with today we'll be covering the basic overview of what is big data what we are going to study and what all things and modules are covered in this today we are starting with introduction to big data now what do we mean by big data okay, what comes to your mind when you learn about the term big data what comes to your mind when we talk about the term big data more data okay let's start from the data itself now what do we mean by data so data is any kind of information which we are storing is called as a data okay then what is big data how it is different now when we talk about big data it consists of five v's which refers to velocity variability volume what could be other thing similar to this then comes this value and finally is velocity and now what differentiate the data from big data is these five v's now big data includes velocity which means that the amount of uh, the speed of data which is coming in every minute every uh, unit of time that is what we refer to as velocity the data which has been coming in coming in in a particular time itself that what we refer to as velocity then we have is variability which means that the kind of different types of values or uh, different kind of variety of data which is coming in in the form of maybe text we refer to as variability like what all variabilities do we have in this data then we have as volume the amount of volume which is coming in uh, in particular time or in particular amount amount of data data then we come to the value now what would be the value the kind of insights we can gather from this one okay the kind of insights or uh, analytics we can extract from this massive amount of data that is what we refer to as value the value that data is able to give us slash insights and finally we have is the veracity which means addressing the accuracy and trustworthiness of the data so whether the data which is coming in is it reliable or not is it reliable or not reliable or can say trusted or not so that is what refers to as big data so big data whenever we talk about big data that is how we are differentiating the big data with respect to the traditional data okay that is what we have as a big data so big data is nothing but any kind of volume or any kind of data which is coming in at a huge amount with different kind of possibility or different variety of range of data that is what we refer to as big data now the data we are talking about in this case is mostly above pentabytes pbs okay mostly above pentabytes we do not talk we are not talking about gbs of data we are talking about pentabytes of data pentabyte exabytes zettabytes okay so that is the kind of data we are talking about 
and which all domains are generating this kind of data in examples can we think of examples where we are using or where we can say that we are generating this big data any examples anyone can think of what kind of examples we can think where the big data has been used or where that particular thing is been generating big data yes advertisement sorry come again advertisement yeah, just give me a moment yes say again telecom domain and advertisement okay telecom domain and advertisement mm, yes telecom is generating good amount of data telecom advertisements what else any kind of social media platform every social media platform is generating huge amount of data anything else banks okay, yes banks are also using big data now most of the companies are been shifting into the big data because the data generation is massive nowadays let's say rather than banks let's say it to be financial institutes because then it will include all the stock markets as well so all the financial institutes are generating huge amount of data okay so these are some major of the domains which is generating huge amount of data going forward and they are generating massive amounts of data that is why they need to get work with this big data technologies <clears throat> but okay so that is about the big data part okay now coming to the part of how the big data has been utilizing or how it has been managing everything okay let's understand some basic architecture which understand which all tools and technologies we are using into this big data now let's talk about tools and technologies which we have tools and technologies which we are dealing with with respect to this big data is the so first is obviously because you need to manage a huge amount of data so you need some storage space also we need that uh, part, uh, possible storage space first to store the data so first is data storage unit and to handle all this kind of data all this big we kind of data now five we kind of data what we have is generally we tend to work with either no sql databases then we have is uh, data warehouses and then we have is let's say to be data lakes now in this one example you can go with is hadoop because that's the most popular one we have as data lake when we talk about data warehouse now there are multiple data warehouses are available such as ibm provides the data warehouse then we have amazon aws redshift then we have azure uh, storage lake uh, data synapse okay now similarly if you talk about no sql database we have mongodb hbase so these are some of the data storage unit which has been able to handle that kind of big we data okay all the five v's of data 
or the big data itself. That is the data storage unit which we work with. That is the first part. Going to the second tools and technologies which we have is data processing. Because obviously the data is coming, so we need to process it because ultimately we need to get that V part which is value. Ultimately we have to get this value part as well. So what we do? We do the data processing to get that value. So for that we use data processing and for data processing we use tools and technologies such as such as Parks. That is the first one and the most commonly used Apache Sparks. Now the actual product name is Sparks, but it has been bought by Spark uh, Apache company. That's why it is called as a uh, Apache Sparks. Now it provides you with almost all the possible tools, and this is our main topic we are going to cover in into this particular training as well, which is Sparks. Now it provides you with data processing on real time data processing. It provides you with uh, all the kind of analytics, analytics tools it have, analytics tools and machine learning library as well, MLlib. It also have provide you with more speed, and that's why it has been used the most commonly. Then the second uh, processing unit which we have is the Kafka. Again, that's also Apache product, which is Kafka. The third one, which we have is the, not fools. That is, right. the Hive has been created by Facebook. It's been product given by the Facebook now, which is an open source. So which helps you work with the data, which is stored in the data lakes. And the major benefit of using the Hive is that it is SQL like queries. So if you know about SQL, Hive is easy to go with. Okay, So that is what we have as the data processing units. Now we have done some basic processing. Now to analyze it further, what we do? We move to the next part of the same, which is data visualization. Because the basic visualization is done, uh, basic analysis is done, but we want to go into more advanced part. That's where the data analytics come into play. Data analytics. In the data analytics, we generally go with Tableau and Power BI. We have additional tools such as Azure services, Azure and AWS services. For Azure, we have Quick Sight, which we're going to work with. Now, the analytics is also done. Uh, we have discussed about machine learning part because we have MLlib library. So that also get done in the Apache Sparks also. That is what we have as the wholesome part. Now there are a few uh, additional tools and technologies which we have, such uh, which includes into this Hadoop architecture, which has been helpful in extracting data and loading it elsewhere. That is what we call it as a ETL tools. ETL tools. Now for ETL tools, we have Azure Data Factory, which we are going to work with. So this is all the tools and technologies which has been generally used, which has been generally been implemented when we are talking about uh, big data. And if anyone have any doubts, do interrupt me in between. Uh, we'll not be like, we'll be doing a uh, uh, doubts at the end. If you feel like you have any doubt, just ping me in between. We'll discuss it parallelly.
now that is the tools and technologies which we are, which we are going to use and generally it has been used in big data tools now talking about how these are been used in a flow that's the big data standard architecture okay it's just a standard architecture we're going to discuss about Now, standard architecture starts with the multiple data sources. Now we can have multiple data sources available from where the original data is coming in. Okay, we can have multiple data sources coming in. So that is, the, these are the data sources, original data sources. These are the original set of data sources. We can have n number of data sources. It's not been defined as four or three. It can be n number of data sources we can have. Then we go with collecting all the data into a single. Uh, that is what we have as the ETL job, where we are extracting, load, transforming, and loading. Okay, and that has been given into a data storage, a big data storage unit. A big data storage unit can be a Hadoop or a data lake or a data warehouse. From there on, we start with next step of analytics. The actual analytics starts from here onwards, where we are going to work either with BI tools, either with the BI tools or with the machine learning or the AI part. That is how the standard architecture works with, uh, works in the case of big data technologies, where we are starting with the data source, data ingestion, let's say it to be data source, data ingestion, The data storage, we have already named it. Data storage, then data processing, because here we are going to use Sparks or something. Data processing, and then the analytics. That is how the flow of Big data architecture follow starting from a data source, data ingestion or data uh, extraction, unloading that is what we have as ETL, then data storage, data processing using maybe Sparks that's the most common one. You can call it so. Sparks is doing that processing part and then going to the BI or the AI part, which is business intelligence or either the AI itself. Now, after that, after all of this, we have the final layer, which is like to show before demonstrating the product or before show, demonstrating the final result, we also go with data governance, which is simply as that we should keep the integrity of data intact and also we should keep the security of data. The privacy and security of data should be intact. It should not get hampered at any point of time. That's the standard architecture. It does get changed as we are working with different kind of business problems. But that's something we call it as a, the uh, standard architecture. In this particular flow, we start to set each and every parameter, each and every technologies in the same parameter or uh, in the same structure only. The structures like uh, data warehouse will have different kind of ETLs. Uh, Hadoop or data lake will have different kind of ETs. So that is what we refer to with this. Clear everyone? Any questions up to this part? Yes, no, maybe. 
Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I'm kind of like new to this stuff. So I was wondering if you could uh, uh, explain me about uh, SQL, difference between SQL and no SQL. Sure. So yes, we are going to discuss all of them as we'll be moving with topic wise scenario. So as soon as we start with the topics, that is what we are going to discuss also. But for a briefing, because today is more like a introductory session where you will be where we'll be covering as a whole itself. So let's discuss about that. So this is about the basic architecture. Now talking about the languages which you're gonna use or talking about the languages which we are gonna work with. So languages which have been used to make this operation successful, we come as first is the Python, second one is SQL, third one is basic Linux commands for filing system. basics uh, linux commands for filing system these are all the commands all the languages which you're going to learn not talking about your your part which is sql and no sql let's discuss about this now sql and no sql is a type of databases or dbms system now if i if we go with the very briefing of sql part or data storage So we have two types of DBMS. Now, what do we mean by DBMS for DBMS first? So DBMS is database management system. So how does that work? Okay, let's write it over here instead. Not too much beneficial. Now, here when we talked about different types of data sources, data sources generally refers to as the sources from the dbms also many of them are going to be dbms systems also so what do we mean by databases or data sources now when you refer to a database when you write a term as database the database is simply a storage unit just as a hard drive which we have in our laptops that is what we refer to as database it can be anything Okay, so simple database is nothing but a simple data storage unit or a simple hard drive only. As a layman term, I'm giving this. On top of that, DBMS or database. Now, when you are using this hard drive in your laptop, it is acting as a storage unit where you can store anything. Okay, but how are you operating that hard drive? With the help of this operating system? Windows operating system, Mac operating system, Linux operating system, right? With the help of operating system, you're able to access this hard drive, which has been installed as a hardware in your laptops or in a computers, right? Similar to that, we have database. And when the database or data unit is been connected to a DBMS, when that storage unit is been connected to a DBMS, that's when it is called as a database. That is when it is called that storage unit, that hard drive is called as a database. Now, what is DBMS? Then? DBMS refers to database management system. Database management system. So what does that name suggest itself? That it is to manage this database. So it is like a operating system or a system which is helping you operate this database okay now there are two types of dbms which we have general we, uh, we have is two types one is sql type one is no sql type now sql is a command okay sql is referred to as structured query language
you know when your dbms when you can operate with your dbms using sql language that is what we refer to as sql type sql dbms or uh, rdbms basically they are also referred to as rdbms relational database management system but when you are not able to use sql into the uh, into the dbms that is when it is referred to as no sql databases okay that is what we refer to as no sql databases now no sql databases have a uh, when you talk about rdbms they are generally used when you want to store a data in the form of rows and columns or table like format when you want to store your data in the form of tables that is when you use the rdbms or the sql databases but when we talk about no sql no nase no sql have multiple ways of storing the data it includes graph db it includes uh, object oriented database object oriented database graph object oriented database and hierarchical database okay it have graph databases object oriented database and hierarchical databases the storage type completely differs the way you are storing the data in the case of rather than this rdbms where you are storing the data in the form of rows and columns only in this case data uh, the storage of data completely different uh, it's completely it completely gets changed in this case now in the case of graph you are storing data in the form of links like this particular point is linked to this then this so data is stored in this particular architecture in the graph like form okay in a uh, coordinate systems that is how the data is stored in the case of graph dbs when we talk about object oriented database now data is been stored in the way of objects like uh suppose if you are like suppose if you are searching for a phone on a amazon okay if you are searching for a phone on a amazon if you write a phone now when you search for that phone it will instantly give you every detail including image video text description okay and uh, now uh text data description goes the same way recommended product because below that we have recommended products also right so every detail is coming up as a one single instance that is what we refer to as object oriented database that this is created as a single object and you are getting the whole object as one when you are look when you are working with the object oriented database you are getting objects rather than a single entry or single value okay that is what we refer to as object oriented database then we have the hierarchical database now hierarchical database is something like when you are storing data in a hierarchy when you are storing your data in the form of hierarchies such as uh, that suppose you are storing some data i'm just taking some random data as shoes okay i want to store a data for the shoes the shoes can be men's kids females or women's okay now in the men's we can have boots sandals slippers similarly with the kids also we can have three categories for females also whatever the categories then in the boots we can have mountain boots sneakers and so on so when your data is getting stored in this kind of hierarchy structure that is what we refer to as hierarchical dbms is it clear uh, yes that is what we refer to as all the different types of data sources and you can have multiple different data sources onto this architecture into this particular architecture itself <clears throat> into this big data architecture you can have different types of data sources which is working all together so data sources which we work with 
is like any kind of SQL database. It can be any kind of SQL database, NoSQL database, or a live streaming. Live streaming data. So these are some general types of data sources which we generally refer to when we are talking about data sources. Now, ingestion tool, we have discussed about ETL tools such as Data Factory, okay, which has been used from the Azure services. So, yeah, here it is. So, ETL tools as a data factory, which we are going to work with to use it as a ETL tool to extract and load the data. Additional to that ETL tool, we have uh, Airflow. Let's mark it over there only. Because in ETL, when you're dealing with Hadoop or data lakes, that's when we go with data tools or uh, ETL tools such as uh, Scoop, Airflow, Kafka we have already discussed, but that's also a type of uh, ETL also. We can use using the Kafka. And one more is there is Flumes. So these are some of the basic ETL tools which have been generally used. In addition to that, we have more also, which is Peg or uh, Hive, uh, sorry. Uh, Peg or the, there's one more. I just forgot. So this is what we have as the basic architecture, tools and technologies and the big data architecture and what is big data. Okay. Now coming to the now part, which is the uh, Python part. Now in the Python, we'll be starting from tomorrow onwards with the first session starting with Python only. We'll be starting the first session with the Python. Now how the Python has been utilized for working with Sparks architecture. When you're working with Sparks, the major and the most commonly one is the PySparks. PySpark is the most commonly used tool, which is a Python environment, which has been done, which has been used, utilized by using the Python environment. So that is what we are going to start with our big data technology classes that how to work with Python, how you can do some basic Python. Okay. So how many of you know about Python or have some bit of experience in Python? Is there uh, people? Or people who are completely new to the Python? Okay, completely new to the Python and yeah, one is in Python. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem. So we'll start the Python from very base itself. So let's do some basic Python coding today. Okay, anyone? Uh, okay. Is it just for Python or you do not have any at all, uh, no experience at all in the coding field? I'm asking to everyone. People who are saying new to the Python, is it new for coding also? New to the coding, no problem. So we'll discuss the coding practices all uh, in the same format. So for that, we'll be using a collab notebook. Okay. Now let me show you the collab also to interact with some basic. Open this. Let me reshare this screen. So we are going to use the collab notebooks to work with the Python environment. We use the Python environment. We'll be using the collab notebook. Now what is collab notebook? You can use Jupyter notebook also. Okay, so there are two ways you can either use the Jupyter notebooks or the collab notebook, whichever you are comfortable with. But I'm I'll be using a collab notebook now. It's an online platform, so you do not need to do any kind of installation. Simply, what you can do is simply go to Google, Google Collab, just search it out. This will be the collab icon, so you can open it from this one. When you open this new notebook will come to this particular page. You will come to this particular page. Now here, what we have is 
So once you connect, it will provide you with the pre-installed virtual environment, which will be having 12 GBs of RAM and uh, around 100 GBs of uh, online cloud storage. So if you see it over here, you can see there's a 12, almost or higher than 12 GBs of RAM and desk space is 107 GBs. Okay, so that is what we have as a collab. And it is using Python 3, which is the latest version. So it is already using that latest version of Python and built inside this. And to work with the data part, now that is where you can connect. So that is the storage unit. So you can, here you can see 81 GBs are available. So you can store or you can work with up to 81 GBs in this particular case. Okay, so that is the major one which we are going to use to learn Python. Uh, that's the platform. So everyone can get uh, log into this one. Let's discuss about the basic of Python today. And tomorrow we'll start into the uh, deeper parts of the Python itself. Okay. Not coming to the Python. The Python is also divided into two cases. Now you must have uh, seen some softwares. If you have someone, uh, some bit of uh, when you start exploring this Python, we'll come across there are two things. One is the IDEs, and another one is, are these notebooks. Now, what is the difference between these two? Okay, so when you talk about IDE, which is uh, helping you to develop uh, any kind of application, web app, web application, or backend for the web app. That's when you go with the, or when you're entering into the development part, that's when you use the IDs. But when we are talking about the data field, okay, in the computer, we have majorly two uh, multiple domains. One is the IT field, uh, one is the development field, where we are developing any kind of application, any kind of website. So all those kind of development has been going into the development domain. Okay, that is what we refer to as development domain. Then another one is the data domain which we are entering into. Okay, so we'll be more sticking toward the data domain. Now, what is this data domain? When you are dealing with multiple kinds of data, when you're dealing with the data itself, or, or a, some good amount of data itself, that's when you go with this kind of notebooks. Because ID is generally used uh, when you're dealing with development. Why it is? Because it's a, it's a platform where you're writing thousands of lines of code and you want to execute all those code at once. The benefit of using ID is that when you are writing thousands of lines of code and you want to execute all of that in a single uh, time, that is what we refer to as IDs. That is the use of the IDs. But when we talk about notebooks, that is the advantage that you can run a single line of code one by one. So when you are dealing with a bigger amount of data, if you start loading them again and again for each and every processing, it becomes very difficult to handle. That's why once the data has been loaded in a single cell, now this is what we refer to as a cell. You can have multiple cells over here like this. Once a data has been utilized or once a command has been run in a single cell, it will get stored into that cell. You can reuse it again and again till the time you're not interrupting this cell, till the time you're not disturbing or rerunning this cell. Okay, suppose if I want to store a data as in a variable, now this is what we call it as a variable. Now, X is a variable over here. I want to store a value in this. It's an empty container. Okay, and I want to store a value as one. Now, once the X is written as one, now that one value has been stored into this X variable, into this X container. Now, you can use this n number of times. If you want to sh show the output of the same, you can use print X. Now, print is used to show the output of a particular variable. So if you run it, you get as one and you can run it n number of times. So data stored in a single cell will stay in that only until unless we make it change. If you see, I run it multiple times, that value is same. But if I rerun this, now X is having three now. The one has been replaced by three. But if when you run these values now, it will be replacing that. But the output shown in this one stays the same. So all of these cells are working independently. 
okay they are working independently uh, of the execution so that is the advantage which we get using the notebooks over the ids so that's why we'll be using the notebooks instead of ides in the data domain and we are specifically using collab because it does provide you with a good size of ram and uh, hard drive because many of students sometimes does not have a laptop which can handle bigger data so that's why we are working with the collab notebook so it will not impact your laptops even if you're working with smaller specification it will still work out very fine so that's why we'll be working with collabs so now let's show with uh, let's work out with some basic commands now in the python part we'll not be going to the development domain we'll be sticking to the python oriented for the data domain we'll be learning about the python part which is oriented toward data domain only so we'll be more focused about that particular section but before entering into that part let's go sir, with some basics of python now here you can see we have different types of data we can store okay so first is the input and output statement let's start with that that is what we call it as the inbuilt libraries okay that is what we refer to as inbuilt library Inbuilt library, the first one which we have already used, which is the print statement. The print statement help you uh, show you the output which has been stored into the Python. To get some output from it from this particular Python, that's when you use a print statement. And similarly, if you want to provide some input to this data or to inputs or to, to the Python, that's when you use the input statement. Input, and you can pass anything inside this, like uh enter enter your name so if you run it it is asking for enter your name so if i add sahil Jaj, you can see that execution has been completed which means now this x value have stored this name inside this so if you print this x, if I want to get the output of this, simply I run the print x. So you can see Sahil Garg has been printed. Okay. So that is how we are storing, we are giving input and output from the Python. Now, what kind of data or what kind of values we can give as an input values? So that is what we refer to as data types. That is what we refer to as data types. So we have different types of data type. First, starting with strings. So if you're storing any kind of character, such as any kind of name, such as Sahil Gad. Now, when you're writing a string value, when you're writing a some text, when you're writing, it is always written in the form of these quotes. By adding these quotes, you're saying that this is going to be a text value. That is what we refer to as string data or string data type then you have the numbers which is integer type so number is any kind of number which can be like 12 or 13 or 18 or whatever any kind of big number that is what we refer to as integer data type integers that you are adding integers over here then we have is the decimal which is any kind of decimal number which is referred to as which is called as a float now that is what we refer to as float data type okay now let's run it let's see all three data types similarly we have booleans also date time as well but that is the commonly ones which we generally work with now let's see check out the type now again type is also inbuilt function so when you pass cap this and run it you can see str which means it's a string uh, variable because char is the variable over here and this is the value stored in the, into that variable and if you want to check out what is the data type of this variable it is equivalent to the whatever the value it has been storing so the value stored in this one is the string so it shows your type as string. So that is how you can 
check out with your different data types or work with different data types. It, they does have some inbuilt functions. Every data type has some inbuilt functions. Now how you can get that? So simply press dot, enter. You come across different inbuilt functions available to be applied onto the string value. Now capitalize means in uh, increasing uh, making the letters first letters capital. That is when you use the capitalize. Similarly, we have upper. If you run this, you'll get Sahil Gar written as upper letters. Similarly, if you make it as lower, you'll get the uh, name written as in the lower letters. That is some simpler data types which we have. These are called as simple data types. And this is how you can use the inbuilt operations available with those data types. What does it mean? Uh, what's the name, the lower, upper, and all? Character is the function, right? Sorry, come again. The character is the data type. The character dot lower, character dot upper. Um, this lower, upper, and all, it's, is it function? Inbuilt function? Yeah, these are the, yeah, uh, these are the functions or methods you can call it, okay. which is inbuilt available with that data type. Okay. Or uh, with you. that string, uh, with that uh, data type, exactly. Okay, thank you. And character is a variable which is storing a string value. So it is applying all the uh, operations on that string operation, string value itself. So these are inbuilt functions or methods available with that particular data type. Clear? Now when we talk about in operation now let's talk about some arithmetic operations also so let's start with operations now basic operation which we have so if you want to some uh, do some kind of uh, addition or interrupt. subtraction or multiplication yes uh, yeah uh, i was wondering if you could tell me why did you uh, after the first bracket why did you leave it uh, blank this one you're talking about yeah yeah isn't it supposed to be X or something? No, it has been okay. So that is two ways. So you can definitely use the lower and then pass X value in that also. That is also applicable. But this is how you can directly use it uh, as a efficient method. So when you're supposed you are you want to apply some changes onto a onto a string data type. So what you do is you call it variable because the scar is the variable which is storing a string data type or a string value. Just press a dot and press enter. The dot refers to the extension of this. That what extensions do you want to apply on top of it? That is how you're using this. That capitalize, case, fold, center, count, encode, and like multiple operations are there. So that is where you're passing the lower. In the case of lower, you can see there's no suggestion, which means you do not need to pass anything. But if you go with the, suppose if you go with replace function, if I go with replace, now you can see it is showing you some suggestions as old and new. So first you have to provide what do you want to replace and with which value do you want to replace? So it is dependent on the coding of these functions. Like the, when these functions have been created, they are kept empty. That's why they're not giving any error, even if we are keeping them empty. So we didn't uh, we didn't added any kind of variable uh, we didn't added any kind of uh, argument in these particular functions why it's not showing in uh, lower sorry the replace has some uh, 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 some uh, yeah because the replace is okay understand the use of that particular function so replace when you're using a replace that means in a string you want to replace particular character Yes, understood. But why it's not um, you know, giving any suggestion for lower lower method? Because lower is a direct command. When you're okay. saying that make the lower, that okay. means it's understood that just make all the characters lower. So the default character types method is lower. Exactly. Okay, it's a default you. thing you go, it's going and that's why uh, it is not giving any kind of suggestions. Okay, thank you. Because so, by default, so I think said, like, so I think the question is like, uh, why we are not giving any value in the bracket so just like as you have mentioned like print x so x has printed the uh whatever like number or value, value stored in it. it 
So here you're, you're not giving any input lower. So by default, it is giving Sahil Gar. That's where uh, we got confused. Like why it is directly giving Sahil Gar if even if you do not give any value to that lower function. Because I think because it is are, already. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's where we got So and these are two things, different things. See, this is Python function. Okay, this is the inbuilt function of Python. But if you talk about this lower function, this is the inbuilt function of this data type. Okay, this is the inbuilt function of this string data type. Okay, if you call this like this, if we uh, go like lower, it is not a function. It's not a Python function available. Okay, it's not a Python function. It's okay. the function which has been linked or associated only with a okay. string variable. If you mm -hmm. have a string variable, only then you can call it. Only then you can use it. So it is understood that if you are using it with a string variable, you are applying that function on this only. That's why we are not passing any argument inside that lower operation. Yes, but when we it talk is about taking the value string, because you have already declared the char is equal to Sahil Garg. From there, it is taking that, that Sahil Garg. Exactly. Because okay. we are, it has already been associated with this particular variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Understood? Yep. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got your point. Now, coming to the operations part. So, when you want to do some kind of arithmetic operations, that's how you can directly do it. So here we have number and decimal. So you can use this multiplication sign to do the direct multiplication of uh, numbers. Okay. Similarly, we have division. So that is what we refer to as arithmetic operators. Similarly, we have comparison operators. So let's say arithmetic operations operations. First is arithmetic. Operators such as uh, plus, minus, multiply, divide, mod, power, and so on. So these are some of the basic mathematical arithmetic operations available. Similar to this, you can simply just pass multiplication over here for now. Similar to that, we have the comparison operators. Comparison operators. Less than, greater than, equal to, and we refer to as equal to equal to. We do not refer equal to sign only. That is used to assign a variable. A single equal sign is used to assign a variable. But when we have to compare whether this is equal to this, we use double equal signs. Similar to that, we have like less than equal, uh, greater than equal to and less than equal to. And this is what we refer to as not equal to. Okay. So these are some comparison operators which we have. So num, suppose greater than decimal. So if you are checking for this, so it is showing you false, which means num is not greater than decimal. So that is what we have as a comparison operators. Then similar to that, we have the logical operators. Uh, logical will logical operators. Such as and or not. You can see these got blue. Now when it is getting color coded, that means it is an inbuilt value available. Oops. And to make a comment, okay. Now what is comment? Now you can see I'm using hashes at multiple locations. I'm using hashes. Now that is what we refer to as comments. Now comments, why do we use a comment? So using of a comment is generally uh, when you just want to write it, when you want to just write something, for the understanding purpose of humans. You don't want the platform to execute those commands. 
that is what we refer to as comments and in the case of python how do you provide a comment by putting a hash sign in the top uh, in the front of it so if you put a hash sign in front of any line that line will be said as a commented line so when an execution will be happening it will not read that hashed line so once it saw a hash it will move to next once it uh, like here it will execute it it will see that here we have a hash so it will not move forward again this one hash it will not move forward here it does not have any hash so it will start executing number star and the decimal so it will execute this command and will show you the result as a product of these two numbers and here you can see that we have two operations over here this and this right but it show you only false so what it did so how that cell shows you output it will only show you the output whichever is the latest one whichever is the in the last only so it is showing you output for this only if you want to see both of them you have to pass it into the print statement so when you run it like this and here also when you run it like this it will be showing you the output for both the lines now you can see the product of it and the uh, pro, uh, output of this as well. Clear everyone? And if you want to use further the print statement in much more efficient way, what we can simply do is you can pass some strings also like this using f. So this is. Uh, this is the product first. Now, if you want to pass a variable inside a print statement, inside a string variable, that's how you do it. By putting an F in front of it, when you, whenever value, whichever value you're passing into this curly braces, it will be reutilized as a variable. You can pass any kind of variable inside this curly braces and this will be kept as a constant string so when you run this you can see this is the product number 36.0 uh, 366.0 why we so are really if I just yes why we are mentioning here pin print come again why we are mentioning f letter in the often it helps you it says that uh, we have some uh, now you can uh, we have some, uh, uh, what was the value? Formatting that we are providing some additional formatting into this print statement. Okay. In this print statement, we are de defining that we are providing some additional formatting into the statement which you are getting. Okay, the without, statement. Without F also, it will print the values, right? No, if you are removing that F, it will just print it as number times two. You can see this. Okay. Okay, okay. So that's F defines into this print statement. This F defines that there is some additional formatting available. So look out for that thing. You're giving that kind of instruction to this print statement that there is some additional formatting available. Yeah. Can I where is that can available? I that has been represented using this curly braces. Can I execute, please? Yes. Okay. 24. We, we haven't given uh, input, right? The input is okay. Values are stored over here only. No, we have already declared this thing. Okay. So that is why it is just using that number. Okay, right, right. And uh, what so if it can we... be any variable? Like if you just run it, uh, rerun it, if you change the value of number to maybe suppose 2000. Okay. And if you rerun this again, without making any change that value get updated over here as well yes yes what if you want to do some formation of the output like uh, coloring font like that that is not available in this print part like there are available but we don't need that kind of things okay for that we do have a text operation over here like okay. if you want to just give some heading that's why you can use a heading so heading one or the main title one so when you execute it you can see heading one you got yes. similar to that text again you can just pass if you pass double hashes and multiple hashes heading two 
that's a kind of a subheading you can add which is slightly smaller in size and so on okay. so okay. that is what you can do over here provide some additional text but for matting part if you want to do some kind of beautification for your printing results that's what we generally don't do in the in this particular case okay thank you Okay, so that's all for today. Any question, query, doubts, if anyone have? Uh, yeah, uh, I didn't fully understand uh, the one that you wrote, uh, um, equal to, equal to. Okay, this one? Okay. Yeah, double equal so What does that mean? So here we have equal to equals, which means we are saying whether this number is equivalent to this decimal place. Like we are comparing two uh, digits or two numbers or two variables. We are comparing two variables that whether they are equal to or not. That is what we are comparing. Now, if you see it over here, if you use a single equal sign, I guess that would be a confusion that why we are using double equal signs over here, right? Because oh, it's for the single variable. equal sign has been already been used to assign a variable. Yes, you can ask. No, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yes, so I'm saying because single equal sign is already been used to assign a variable, to assign a value to a variable. That's why to compare two variables, whether they are equal or not, that's when we tend to go with double equal signs. Oh, okay. Understood. So what will be the output? Like print num equal to equal to dec decimal? That will be false because they are not equal. They are not equal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we are just asking like whether those are equal to or not. Okay. Yeah. That is what the comparison is. You are simply doing the comparison. What is the comparison of this with respect to this? It can be true or false. There are two possibilities only. Okay. You done, everyone? Any other question, query, doubts? Any feedbacks if you would like to give me today so that we can implement it for the upcoming classes? Nice. Actually, it felt nice. On the initial day, initial day, hopefully we'll be gaining more knowledge with your value time. Definitely. So, uh, like uh, Python, at uh, like what kind of uh, knowledge we should be having uh, as a data engineer for Python, like basic, intermediate, or? So... Yeah, I'll not. Uh, rank it as a basic intermediate or this thing will be more uh, we should be more uh, good into the part of pandas like we have fixed number of libraries in the python which is pandas numpy seaborn matplotlib and pysparks so these are some of the libraries which we should be good with to have some good uh, demonstration because these are these libraries which i just now talked about and we will be practicing them on them also because the, right now we are doing the people who does not know have any idea regarding coding that's why we are doing some basic coding because that is like very base only okay that how to assign a variable how to write a basic coding lines that is what you are doing and uh, but after that we'll enter into the specific python specific to the data domain itself. because when you talk about development as i mentioned in two cases development and data domain for de 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 uh, development we have oops concept for data domain we have this pandas and these libraries specific so that is where we'll be discussing more towards that is where we'll, we uh, will try to work more efficiently to understand how things have been working out so that because you should uh, be i'm good not basically from a developer we... background so yeah yeah, yeah no, don't don't worry as we'll move forward we'll be guiding you with yeah. what you can further learn okay as we will be moving forward we'll uh, i'll definitely be helping you with what all things you can further learn by your own or like a self-study part as well will be also guiding you with that also. Because it was the very first session, so I don't think to give a homework for the very first class itself. But from next class onward, you'll be getting small tasks also, which you have to do uh, for your own practice, for the self-practice part. Right?
okay yeah and for like today's session you can just uh, read out or you can learn about uh, python like how the basic python works uh, so you can just go through it on the internet also, also so that tomorrow we'll also be practicing anyway but for your own self study you can just work out with the python part today okay sure sir thank you okay so then that's all for today thank you everyone